Okay. Um, all right, let's go ahead and get started. Um, Janet Wollison, who's been working on the uh, metacognition project in class, and she did all the surveys for the front end, um, is a graduate student in the department. She is interested in science education research, particularly in a college setting, particularly in uh, introductory level courses. And Janet had this class back in 2018. She has SI for this course, and she's now TA for three different courses. She's been a teaching assistant for three different courses in the department. But uh, one of the things that she's never done that she just sort of blindly pointed out the other day is she's never lectured to a class in a big space. <laughs> and I was like, okay, you're going private. So, <laughs> Janet, <laughs> so, so when she woke up, we, we, we got her to relax a little bit. And so she's going to be presenting the lecture today. We'll record it and post it as normal. It's a normal lecture. Take your notes. Ask any questions that you want to ask. Um, things like that. And we'll just see how it goes. Go ahead, Jan. So we're getting ready to see me forget everything that I know about neurons and probably go into a coughing fit because I kind of have a cold. But we're going to get through it one way or another. So. Um, today we're, chap we're starting chapter 37, so about neurons, nerve function, that kind of thing. Nerve cells are really cool. They are like signaling cells and the mechanism by which they do that I think is really interesting. And like they look kind of cool. They don't look like your typical cell that you learned about like last semester. Yeah. So. You might want to go to the fish field and speak a little louder. Okay. Okay, so the first thing we're going to talk about are the parts of the neuron. So starting off with the dendrites, those are the branchy things that like stick off of the main cell body, which is this part right here. Um, the dendrites kind of collect information that is being given to the cell from other neurons and things like that. And then the cell body is where like the nucleus and other organelles are located. And then the next part that we have is the axon hillock, which is really like the interesting part where the action happens that we'll get to later. And then the axon hillock is what starts the signal that then gets transferred down the axon, which is the long part of the cell. And then it ends down here at the end in these little projections called synaptic terminals, which are these. And so here is a close up of what's happening right here. This part right here is the synaptic terminal of like this cell. And then this would be the membrane of the next cell that it's talking to. And then in between the two is this gap area. And that's called the synapse. And that's, we'll get into more of what that is later on. Um, one thing to note about this is that the signal can only go this direction. It can only go from the dendrite to the cell body, to the axon hillock, axon, synaptic terminals, etc. And so, You've seen this a lot of times in this class, but this is another one of those situations where in your book, figure 37.2, the figure is drawn from left to right, but it totally could be drawn the other way. And so don't just memorize this figure, memorize the actual order of how the signal flows through the neuron. Um, so then there's a d couple different flavors of neurons and they conduct electrical signals. Um, so the first kind of neurons are sensory neurons, and so those are going to be things in like your hands and feet and extremities um, that are picking up information from the environment. And so those are going from the peripheral nervous system to the central nervous system. Your peripheral nervous system is everything outside of your brain and spinal cord. So it's going from the outside to the inside and then like to your brain. And then motor neurons are kind of the opposite of that, where they're sending signals from the central nervous system. So from your brain out to the peripheral nervous system, to glands or muscles or things like that to tell you to move or something like that. And then, and so like a sensory neuron would be when you like put your hand on a hot stove, you feel the heat of that. And so your sensory neurons are gonna take that information and send it back to your brain and then you're gonna get a motor neuron command back out to your hand to lift it off. 
And then there's these weird kind of abstract things called inner neurons, which are which integrate sensory information and or motor commands. That doesn't really mean a whole lot to me. Sounds very vague. So like an example of an inner neuron would be um, like if you're in, I don't know, like a restaurant or something and you smell the food, you see the food, you hear people talking, you hear music, maybe it's particularly like hot or cold, all of that information gets integrated through inner neurons and sent back to like the central nervous system. And then also inner neurons are kind of cool because they're responsible for like the reflex arcs. So like when you put your hand on something hot, it doesn't actually have to like go all the way back to your brain and then to your hand before you move it. It kind of just like bypasses that and allows you to like reflex jerk back really quickly. So those are kind of cool. And then like we said, um, the neurons outside of the central nervous system are peripheral nervous system neurons. So everything outside of the brain and spinal cord. So the nervous system is an electrochemical system and to contrast that with like the endocrine system that we've already talked about, that's like a primarily chemical system with hormones that are getting circulated through the blood. We talked about that. But the nervous system has both an electrical and a chemical part to it. Today we're going to talk about the electrical part and then on Monday we'll talk about the chemical part of the system. So the first like concept to kind of grasp is when you have a difference in electrical charge between two points, there's an electrical potential that's generated between them. So like for example, um, like a battery has a positive side and a negative side, and then between those two points, there's an electrical potential generated, which we call a voltage right there. Um, and so that's kind of like the frame of what to think about here. When this potential exists across a membrane, it's called a membrane potential. It makes sense. Um, it's usually measured in millivolts and it's expressed inside relative to outside. So like the inside of the cell is negative relative to the outside of the cell. Um, usually negative in sign. And then think back to like the root hairs of plants. We talked about how those are really negative compared to the environment and so they would have like a really negative membrane potential. Like you would say the membrane potential is minus 200 millivolts or whatever it would be. So now starting to talk about nerve function. The first thing is the concept of the resting potential. So this is a neuron that is doing nothing. It's just at rest. It's just hanging out. It's not carrying information, not transmitting a signal. It's just there. Um, this is a figure showing some of the components of the membrane. And it's taken out of the dendrite up here just to like orient you to where we're looking at in the neuron. Um, we have these sodium potassium pumps that are in the membrane and they help to establish a really negative net membrane potential. So like keep the inside of the cell very negative by pumping three sodium ions, which are the little yellow circles out and taking two potassium ions, which are the little orange squares in. And so since they're a pump and we're pumping something against a concentration gradient. So see, there's a lot of sodium outside the cell and a lot of potassium inside the cell. So when we're pumping sodium out of the cell, that's against its concentration gradient. And so since we're doing that, then you have to use an ATP molecule. And then um, it, taking in the two potassium ions allows it to like reset itself without having to burn any more ATP. So these pumps help to um, keep the cell really negative. And then there are also these potassium channels, which are these orange guys that allow potassium ions to like flow back and forth across the membrane. And we call those leaky channels. You'll hear that term a few more times throughout this lecture. Um, and so we're pumping sodium out, making the cell really negative against its concentration gradient. 
potassium we're bringing in also against its concentration gradient. And so since there's so much potassium on the inside, some of it will flow back out of the cell through these channels. However, this only happens until the flow is balanced by the negative charge. So since the inside of the cell is so negative, all of that potassium is still like held inside the cell because they're positive ions and they want to be where it's really negative. And then, um, so the membrane proteins don't allow the different ions to establish an equilibrium. And that's also maintained because of the pumps constantly going. And just to really simplify thinking about it, you're pumping out three positive things and bringing in two positive things. So that should make sense that it would drive the inside of the cell more and more and more negative. Um, and the figure kind of represents this too, but there's one sodium channel shown and four potassium channels shown. And so in the membrane, there's a lot more of these potassium channels than sodium channels. So effectively, once sodium gets pumped out, you can't, it doesn't have a way to get back in with just the channels that are present at resting potential. So like we said, the membrane remains leaky to, with respect to potassium and very small amounts of sodium, but you can kind of disregard that. Um, oh, and also note that there's ATP being used to keep the cell at rest. We're burning all of this ATP to have these sodium potassium pumps constantly going to keep the cell at the negative state. And down here, at rest, the membrane is polarized to about minus 70 millivolts, which we refer to as the resting potential. So this value is what we call the resting potential, and that's what um, is being maintained by all this ATP that's being burned up here. But it's at rest, it's not transmitting information, we're doing the work to stay at rest, not to actually send a signal or anything like that. Um, and then also be aware of the two different kinds of gradients that we see here. So for the sodium ions, they are being, um, they're at a high chemical and electrical gradient because there's a lot of them outside the cell, so they want to get back in. And the outside is positive and the inside is negative. So once again, the positive sodium, sodium ions want to get back into the cell. Um, and then potassium is on the inside here. It's at a high chemical gradient because there's lots of potassium here and not very much potassium here, but it is allowed to flow out down, the, uh, down this gradient for a while, which helps to prevent there being like a charge gradient because it can balance itself out to a certain extent. Um, are there any questions up to this point? Mostly just so I could stop and get a drink. Um, okay. So this is a graph showing us our minus 70 millivolt resting potential. Nice, pretty, we probably like that one more. But the membrane potential is actually really dynamic. And so what we see for real is something more like what's in this graph here, um, where it actually like bounces around a lot and is not just a nice pretty flat line. Um, and this is because of those like leaky potassium channels. So ions are flowing in and flowing out. So it changes a little bit. Um, and from low grade signals from other neurons, which we'll come back to in a second, but they cause the membrane potential to change and fluctuate between like minus 60 and minus 80 ish. It just kind of floats around. And this is showing our minus 70 resting potential compared to how it's kind of floating around back and forth. Um, oh, and then also, so when the potential goes down relative to rest, so when we're below this line at minus 75, minus 80, et cetera, this is called being hyperpolarized, right there. <laughs> 
and then when the potential is above the resting potential, so when it's at minus 65, minus 60, etc., then we call that depolarization. So hyperpolarization is going below, depolarization is going above. And so the membrane is constantly hyperpolarizing, depolarizing, back and forth, and bouncing around down here at around 70 millivolts. Um, so the dynamic membrane potential shifts that we just talked about, they occur because the dendrites, which remember are the branches and the cell body, are um, integrating information from other neurons. So they take all of these little graded potentials into consideration. So graded potential just means like a potential that changes. It's not like a set value, like the resting potential at minus 70 we just talked about. They can be other voltages. So they're just little signals from other neurons and things that the dendrites and cell body kind of integrate together and then communicate to the axon hillock. And you can kind of think of this graph as like representing the axon hillock's membrane potential. Um, so the membrane potential of the axon hillock becomes a summation of all the little potentials that the dendrites and cell body are picking up. And like, um, if we go back to our picture, so like this neuron here is maybe sending a signal to this neuron and so the dendrites in the cell body are like integrating that information and deciding whether or not they're gonna tell the axon hillock to do its thing. So now if we focus on the membrane potential of the axon hillock itself, um, we have our resting potential at minus 70, but then sometimes the signals from the dendrite cell body can push that axon hillock membrane potential even higher. So if we push it up to minus 55 millivolts, then we cross a line called threshold potential. And so um, minus 55 is what we call the threshold potential. It's the same kind of thing as resting potential. It's a value that we have decided is important. Um, so if the membrane potential of the axon potential rises up above minus 55, then that's when all the fun starts. Before we get into that though, there's kind of a fun little word, kind of English language definition-y kind of thing here. So the tricky thing here is the word potential. So far what we've talked about are membrane potentials, which are like measurements and we've discussed resting potential and threshold potential, which is minus 70 millivolts and minus 55 millivolts respectively. And these are kind of like snapshots that give a whole glimpse. So you can look at a neuron and measure the membrane potential of a particular part of the membrane and you will get a voltage number back to you. However, action potential, which is what we're getting ready to talk about, is like the whole video of something happening. So here, these are like little screenshots of the video that give a glimpse at what's happening, but the video shows you the whole process, the whole sequence of events of, say, this gymnastics routine, but we're gonna talk about action potentials instead. Any questions before we dive into the Processy stuff. Yes. So is the um, membrane potential then, if it goes above that negative 55, is that similar to the other potential where it will be right near it? Because it won't be an exact line, right? It will be bouncing around the negative 55. So the membrane potential is bouncing around, and that's just like if it crosses that line, then it starts the next process. Okay. Okay, so if we talk about the concept of an action potential, 
an example of what would be happening for this. So if we think about like the sensory neurons that we talked about, so the ones that pick up stimuli from the environment. Um, so think about things like your eyes or your nose or your ears. You see something and signals get started in your eyes to send them back to your brain. Same thing with your nose. Um, or if we focus on your ears, right now the sound of my voice is vibrating the eardrum that is in all of your ears. And that's causing action potentials to be generated that are going to be sent along your auditory nerve back to your brain. And then hopefully your brain is processing that information and deciding to tell your motor neurons that go out to your arms to use your arm muscles to take notes. And that's an example of this process happening. Um, so when we start talking about the function of an axon or the function of a nerve, um, we're going to start with the nerve at rest. So at rest, at resting potential, there's these voltage. Okay, so, so far we've talked about just the sodium potassium pumps and then potassium and sodium channels that are ungated, so they're always open. Now we're going to layer in the idea of there being voltage gated channels for both sodium and potassium that open and close at different voltages because they're voltage gated. So that's what we're going to talk about now. At rest, there are these voltage gated sodium channels that are closed. And like we said, sodium doesn't really have a way to get back in at rest, but it really wants to because it's at high chemical and charge gradients. Um, and so that's happening down here when we're floating around in resting potential. But when the membrane potential of the axon hillock reaches threshold potential, so when we cross that minus 55 millivolt line, then that's when all the fun stuff starts. So that puts us down here, right here, this dashed line is the threshold potential. So this is the minus 55 millivolts. So when we get to that minus 55 millivolt magic number, that's when the sodium channels that are voltage gated open. So us reaching that voltage in the membrane is what causes those channels to just flick open. And so the sodium has been waiting outside of the cell for its chance to come back in. And now all of these different channels are open. And so the sodium just comes rushing back into the cell, which is super negative. So you have all of this positive sodium coming in and that causes the membrane potential to rise all the way up here to around plus 40 millivolts. So we go from being at minus 70 all the way up to plus 40 in like one millisecond. And this is called the depolarization phase because we're depolarizing, moving the potential, the membrane potential above resting potential. And then in your book, it's referred to as the rising phase. So then once we get up to this plus 40 point, what was it that was keeping the sodium or the potassium in the cell beforehand? Why was the potassium there? Yeah. Right, because the inside of the cell was so negative. So now the inside of the cell is really, really positive. So there's nothing holding on to the sodium and so, or to the potassium. And so the potassium starts roaring out of the cell down its um, concentration and charge gradients. And it's leaving through all of these little potassium channels. And so the potassium leaves really fast. And also when we hit this point up here, the sodium channels that were open, they become inactive, not closed necessarily. We haven't gotten to that yet, but they become inactive. So up here, you have all of the sodium in the cell. It's really positive. These channels close, so sodium stops coming in. Potassium channels open and all the potassium that was built up on the inside leaves because the cell is really positive now. And so we get down here back to around resting potential. And this blue line here represents the repolarization phase. So we depolarized to get to plus 40, and then we repolarized to get back down to minus 70. 
Um, and then sometimes, and this is the falling phase, and sometimes we'd, it does drop down below the resting potential, which is this line right here. And we have a hyperpolarization phase, which the book calls undershoot. And so this is just because the potassium is coming in so quickly that sometimes it drops it back down below the resting potential. And so then the pumps and the channels and stuff all balance it back out to around resting potential. And like, notice that this whole process, like all the action here is happening in about two milliseconds. So it is so instantaneously fast. Um, and then, so the action potential, it's rapid, temporary, all of this changes back to resting potential and localized. And so what that means is that at no point in time is the entire cell going through this process. Like it's just happening like right here at the axon hillock. It's not the whole cell that's going through this process. It's like one specific part of the membrane. Um, and axon hillock, keep that in mind that that's where it starts. So then what we've built up so far is resting potential, which is minus 70 millivolts, threshold potential, which is minus 55 millivolts, and action potential, which is this whole process right here. So this is where the thing with the word comes in, that it's very, like, these kind, this kinds of potential are all one thing, and then an action potential is the whole process. It's not just like a measurement, a snapshot of one piece in the membrane and what's happening. And also keep in mind that this super fast process with these drastic changes in membrane potential, channels opening and closing, everything requires no energy to do. This is all, since they're voltage gated channels, they're triggered to open just by the voltage, triggered to close by the voltage. Nothing is being pumped necessarily to get it in and out. We still have the sodium pumps active, but they don't play as big of a role in the rapid depolarization and repolarization. And so it's just, it's it kind of like blows your mind that the whole thing is just requires no energy because you already used your energy to get yourself at rest really negative so all of this could just happen instantaneously. And then this is the figure in your book that shows this process, figure 3712. Um, it starts down here in the bottom left at resting potential, the resting state, minus 70. Um, this figure doesn't show the ungated channels that we talked about, like at the beginning. Um, it just shows the ones that are voltage gated, so controlled by the voltage happening in the membrane. So at the resting state, all of the voltage gated channels are closed, and we just have the leaky ones open and the potassium, the sodium potassium pumps going to keep us at this minus 70 millivolts. And then in the depolarization phase, we have the sodium channels. They click open once we hit minus 55 millivolts, and that allows all the sodium to come in to the cell and pushes us all the way up to plus 40. And then um, we start the repolarization phase. And so our sodium channels have become inactive. And then our potassium channels open and allow potassium to flow out of the cell. And remember that potassium wants to leave due to the sudden charge gradient that it feels because all of a sudden the cell it was hanging out in got really super positive and so now it wants to leave and then it also always had a chemical gradient to deal with because there was a lot of potassium on the inside of the cell and not very much on the outside. And then we can come down here to the undershoot which is caused by the potassium rushing out of the cell like so quickly plus the um, sodium potassium pumps running too, it can just push it down below the membrane and then it eventually balances out um, when the potassium pretty much just figures out where it wants to be through those leaky channels that are always open.
and then the sodium channels that were inactivated during the repolarization actually close again once we get down below the minus 55. That's kind of the number for triggering those open and closed. And then um, it, it was kind of confusing for me whenever I was going through learning this to keep track of where the pumps were and what they were doing when because we just kind of like stopped talking about the pumps and putting them in our figures and stuff. But you can think about the pumps as if there is sodium inside the cell for it to pump out, it's going to do that. So like they're obviously working at resting potential down here because that's what's maintaining the resting potential. They like once all of this sodium from the depolarization phase comes back in, then there's tons and tons of sodium in the cell at this point. And so they're gonna really ramp up here in the repolarization, but it's not like because of anything except for the fact that all of a sudden there's so much more sodium, so you have more pumps working because there's more sodium to go around. And then they slow back down to like what they normally would be functioning at down here once all that sodium is pumped out again. Okay. Any questions about the process? It's kind of a lot and definitely one of those things that just requires like sitting down, reading through it, listening to the recording and just kind of walking through. Cause it's not difficult. It's just, and there's a lot of logic involved. It just requires some time devoted to it to actually like internalize it. Um, but any questions before we move on? Yes. No, the sodium potassium pumps, the biggest role that they play is maintaining the resting potential. So when the cell is at rest, not in an action potential, that's when the pumps are the most important. For the most part, like during the, when the cell is at rest, the, the sodium potassium pumps are what is keeping everything out of whack. Like that's keeping us really negative. The potassium can kind of flow back and forth because like a lot of it will get held in the cell, but maybe we don't want all that potassium in the cell. So it can kind of fluctuate a little bit, but the reason it can never um, reach equilibrium is because the pumps are keeping the cell so negative. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Can you say the second part of that again? Um, I guess, yeah, you could say that. Because yes, the leaky channels are always open for sure. Um, and then the pumps are what keep us around minus 70. They, like, the point of them is that they keep it negative. And then the sodium or the potassium like fluctuating back and forth is what keeps us like right at around minus 70 specifically, but the pumps keep it way below zero and all the work to keep it way below zero is through the pumps. It's just happening at like the regions of the cell. We'll see, we'll talk about propagation like next. That's like what we're getting ready to get into, like how it moves. And so I think that kind of helps like internalize that idea. Cause I completely feel the same way. This, if this is just all one connected thing, how can you have like regions of it doing things if it's all one cell? But we're gonna talk about the propagation and I think that'll help with that.
resting potential is the membrane potential you would measure at rest, which is minus 7. Threshold potential is the membrane potential you read right when an action potential is produced, which is minus 55. So those are numbers, as Janet said, those are numbers you could see on a voltmeter if you were doing the recording on your cell. But the action potential is the whole, the whole spike that occurs. So the Simone Biles slides kind of help show that you can have a snapshot of each part of the machine. But the routine, the entire <coughs> thing, right, is the whole process. The other really important thing to think about with nerves is that the energy is burned to keep the cell at rest. That's where the ATP is really being used up. So the irony is ATP is being used for the cell to do nothing. That's one way of looking at it. Action potential, as Jenna mentioned, that's just responding to chemical and electrical gradients. So that happens with, there's no energy required. You don't have to have any energy to have all that sodium rush in and then have all that potassium rush out. That doesn't require any energy. So the, the function of the cell doesn't require any energy. It's when the cell is doing nothing and waiting to do something that it's burning a whole bunch of energy. Other questions then before we go on to propagation of this? Which I think will help with the question here too about how do you regionalize that? You know, why isn't the whole cell depolarizing? And um, as Janet had on the cell earlier, at no point does the cell as a whole depolarize. It's just these little regions that depolarize. Okay? Anything else? Okay, so like we said, this is a localized shift in membrane potential, so it's happening just at one region of the cell, at the axon hillock specifically. Um, and so this is the information that's transmitted down the axon, like nerves speak in action potentials, that is the information being transferred. And so that will go down the axon and then be communicated to other nerves or certain cells or like glands to release things or muscles to move or things like that. But how does the action potential travel down the axon when we're starting way down at the axon hillock and it has to go the entire length of the axon before it is transmitted to something else? Um, the graded potentials that we talked about before, the signals that are being integrated by the dendrites and the cell body and told to the axon hillock, they don't go past the axon hillock. Like that's as far as communication from other parts of the cell go. And so the action potential itself is transmitted down the axon and becomes known as a transmissible action potential. So this is kind of how that process kicks off. The cell body and the dendrites can push the membrane of the axon hillock to depolarize and sometimes, like, and this, I hate this figure. I think it's so confusing and I cannot believe they started with this because it gives you a snapshot of just like way down the middle of the axon. So it implies that like, oh, this could start the action potential right here in the middle of the axon. It can't do that. That is not how this works. I cannot believe that the book starts with that. Right here is where the signal starts always at the axon hillock. It then can get transmitted down the axon, but it can't just randomly start in the middle of the axon. So if we shift this little box back over to here, where I think it should be, you have, when we hit depolarization, all of these sodium channels open, and so we have the sodium rushing into the cell. And so right where that one channel opens, the cell is becoming really, really positive. And so then the ions that were already present in the cell, so like potassium or chloride or whatever, the negative ones are gonna like congregate over here where the sudden positive part of the cell is. And so now a little further down at the next channel, all of a sudden we have a positive internal part. And so that triggers depolarization because it's moving that potential from minus 70 up higher because now there's just like positive things hanging out, which triggers that sodium channel to open, 
and then the same thing happens again and again and again. So one part of the membrane at the starting at the hillock depolarizes and then that can be enough to bring the next part of the membrane, so like the next channel down, that part can reach threshold potential, depolarize, and so it's essentially just causing action potentials at each of these little like channels all the way down the axon. And that's how it kind of gets propagated down. And so that's what like the localized means where like only all the channels don't just like fling open at once. It's channel opens, channel opens, channel opens, channel opens, all the way down. Um, and then, oh, and then this figure doesn't show it, but then once you had this happen, this part of the cell would be up at the peak of depolarization and would need to repolarize. So like these channels would become inactive, the potassium channels that aren't shown would open, your sodium potassium pumps would come back on and resting potential would get reestablished here as like here the resting potential is going to be reestablished as it's like moving down causing little action potentials down the axon. So then this is another visualization of that. If the axon hillock membrane potential gets pushed up here to the minus 55 threshold potential then this is the process that gets kicked off. So like I said, the membrane potential, the threshold potential is reached at the axon hillock. So these channels open, sodium rushes in, makes this positive and pushes the, um, well, it doesn't make it positive, that's probably confusing. It brings this membrane potential higher to like minus 55, and then those channels open and then the next one's open, and then the next one's open, and that's how it's getting propagated down. And so, remember how we said that the sodium channels become inactive once we like hit the plus 40 peak, but not closed? That happens when we get back down to the resting potential. The inactivation of these pumps is what prevents the signal from going the other way because once these channels close, or once they become inactive, when it gets really positive, then they can't open again, even though like this part of the membrane is theoretically experiencing like the same part as the other side of this. Like if you have all this positive stuff here, this channel is theoretically experiencing the same conditions as like this one is, but this one is in the inactive period. So it can't open again, even though maybe the conditions or what would cause that to happen. Does that make sense? Yes. Not necessarily. That's what I kind of screwed up there. So the inside of the cell in this case, when the sodium comes in would be positive. This one you could assume is just above minus 70 or like, and then it'll bring it higher and higher above minus 70 until it reaches threshold, kicks this open, and then you get the influx of sodium again. Okay. Yes. What this, what do you mean? Like the, the change in membrane potential, the change in voltages, like the pattern is the same all the way down. Yes. Like the process that we saw here, like this is an action potential. These numbers, minus, minus 55 and minus 70, those are threshold and resting potentials. It doesn't like change or vary for different things. Like for an action potential, these are always the pieces, always the numbers, always the channels that open at these places. An action potential is an action potential is an action potential. Um, so then to finish clicking through our propagation, 
of the action potential. Maybe. Recognize that what is still missing from this are the potassium, like the potassium outflow and then the pumps kicking back on to actually like repolarize the membrane and get it back down. So like maybe at this point, this cell has had the sodium come in and then it had the potassium channel right here that's not shown. That opened up and the potassium left and then maybe like over here, the sodium potassium pump that isn't shown, that started working again. And so these cell or these, this part of the membrane is back down to resting potential while this is still carrying on all the way down. And that gets the membrane back to resting potential, really negative, ready to be fired again instantaneously without extra energy being added. Thanks. <laughs>